let's let's let we don't always get it right the first time. It's on my it's on my page. Uh, the next lesson is a kind of funny one uh, and interesting. You look smarter when it appears as though you've given some thought to what you have to say. I go on as an anecdote to say put 30 seconds of thought into every one second of speech. Think about it. You'll get it. Put 30 seconds of thought into every one second of speech. When, when I uh, te teaching at Howard, I would always teach my students to process before you speak. Think before you articulate. And here are some tips. You, when, when you're going on an interview, you look really polished when you don't open your mouth and spew out the very first thing that comes to mind. Penny, why do you think people are so inclined to talk without thinking? Because a part of it is they don't understand that every question doesn't deserve an answer. Oh, shut the system down. We got to go. That's the answer. Just because somebody asks you a question, it doesn't deserve an answer. On the bench, one of the things that they advise us to do as judges is we say, I'm gonna take it under advisement. So you have to look at it like this. This person has processed the question. They thought about why they wanna ask you. They've worked out all the rationale for asking you the question and boom, they come to you. Now they've had all of this long history of getting ready to ask you this thing or talk yeah. about this thing. And then they're expecting you instantly to be able to respond. I am never forced to respond. That I don't owe anybody an answer about anything. And I've always treated it like that. And I'm very contemplative anyway in my thought. I just yeah. really, when I speak, I really want it to matter. And I don't just want to say anything. Mm -hmm. And, and I, don't, I don't owe you an answer just because you want to hear from me. You know, we, we, it's that same thing. You hold a law degree, you, you are a minister, you're an author. Everybody thinks that you always want to talk. There are times, and we, we both are introverts, there are times when we just want to sit in the silence and solitude and enjoy the moment of not having to speak. So I, I love your response. Sil silence is an answer. I don't, I don't owe you an answer. You might want it, but I don't owe you that. And for God's sake, young folk, next generation, don't, don't feel trapped and pulled and ensnared into people's conversation. The same way that you don't want people in every one of your conversations, find yourself not having to go into theirs all the time. Sometimes silence is golden. Si silence is golden. How, how, how can you convince people that it's okay to not speak sometimes? Well, first of all, that's how God operates. We ask God a whole lot of things. And sometimes silence is the answer. Uh, just because we ask God, you know, I want to understand why 250 years of bondage, 155 years after the last people were, uh, 1825, I think, the last of us were notified that we were uh, out of enslavement. Why? Yeah. Yeah. God has not answered that for me yet. And so there is power in just understanding that and being able to accept that you are not definitely old and response. Yes, I've never yes. understood that about people. And I've always been a person that never felt pressure to have to give an answer. And so for the young people that are, are listening now, just know that you don't owe anybody that. You, you don't owe anybody that. Oh, uh, you know what? Hi. Hi, Devin. I know you're going to get me. I thought you were trying to come in. Uh-huh. Uh you, you, you met the producer. Devin, hi. We, this, hi. Devin, this is what we do. So we were just catching up in front of all of you all. We're just catching up. Listen, it's been an amazing show. I've been enjoying you guys, laughing at some of your comments. It's been amazing. But as always, let me say good evening, virtual book club cousins. Okay. Hey to my mother, Mama T. I see you there. Mama Annie, my mother in Arapahoe, my cousins in Arapahoe. Well, from Arapahoe, cousin Mickey, cousin Minnie. Cousin Nisi, Cousin Steven, Cousin Sloan, and SJ. How are you all this evening? They, they My goodness. You. Yes, yes. Oh, and I love them too. So Judge Penny, I will not ever call you Penny because when I tell you that Gregory Cutler set it straight tonight, <laughs> I will not judge Penny with all due respect. I have been enjoying you tonight. You guys are amazing. Such awesome conversation. 
And I'm just happy to be able to step in because the virtual book club members have some questions for you all. So um, if you're ready, we can go ahead with question number one. Okay. Um, so, and let's see who this might be for. I guess probably both of you can answer this. How okay. much influence did your faith or walk with God have on you making it through law school? Oh, I'll jump in and then Penny, let's do what we do, my friend. Let's tag team. One of the things that instantly bonded us, and, and I know it's true for, in particular, me and Penny and, and, and Sonia, that I, I know is true. One of the things that bonded us was our faith. It was, it was very clear when we met each other that we were people of faith. As she said, at the time, I remember Penny was, I remember she was at Ebony's at the time, Sonia was at Cathedral of Faith, and that was home for them. And I was the new kid on the block going there from home. But when they embraced me, I knew that they were embracing me from a place with the love of God. And it, it, it was, we, we prayed for each other, and we didn't necessarily always do that publicly. But it was clear that we, we supported each other and we, 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 prayed, we, we prayed for each other that we've got to make this. As Penny said earlier, there were only 12 people who looked like us. Wow. And we, we knew, and this law school was only 10 years old when we went there, when we first went there. So we knew it would be a challenge for us. So it had to be more than our academics. It had to be more than our academics. Uh, Judge, go ahead. You're, you're... I absolutely agree with you. Um... The systematic racism and the institutions of racism is real. Yeah. And so now imagine the frontier, we graduated now 26 years ago. Yes. And we're in an environment in a white school, majority school, majority uh -huh. professors. We had two, uh, Cornel Stevens and Professor Hartfield. We know the only two African-Americans. Uh -huh. And all of these systems are set up for us to even question our intellect. We came, in order to get into law school, you have to be the best and the brightest. Yes. We came there knowing who we are, but imagine being placed almost in a place that's a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And they're speaking language that their grandparents knew. They came in there with outlines from parents and friends, and we're there, sitting there, hearing these brand new languages, and all we had was each other and God. And so the beauty of going through law school or anything that we've gone through and having faith is that to me, now I don't know about other people, mm -hmm. God made me. And when God made me, I knew God put me there. Yeah. And if God put me there, then I know the provision was there for me to be a success. That meant that God would only place people around me who were there for my good. And so that's why we gravitated to one another. But no, the presence of God in our lives was just absolutely, to me, none of us would have made it without the presence of God. And Penny, isn't it interesting when, when you talk about God having placed us there, we heard, we, we re remember we heard the rhetoric, look beside you, one of you will not be here. And, and for the most, most of the time, we were sitting beside each other. But what we knew to be true, when we talk about all things working together for the good of them who love God, we knew that three years down the road, God had already gone there and made the way for us. So we, 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 Devin, we rest, we would rest assured that God had made the way just like he parted the sea. We knew that we, we knew we had work to do. Right. He part the sea and pull us through. But when he parted the sea, we still had to walk. She talked about, we had to read 90 pages a night just for one subject. We did the work, but we knew that God was on our side. And we never competed with each other. Not at all. Something that now you know that's an odd thing because in law school it's all about competition. That's right. But it's that's something right. about the twelve black people in a class of two hundred and twenty. Yeah. It was like we were pioneers and we just we just came together. And I really believe that was because of God. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's amazing. That yeah. if God puts you there, the provision is there. I love that. And, and that and that is why that is why 26 years so we graduated 26 years ago but we met each other almost 30 years that's true and so 30 years we are still friends we, we, we're still friends because what and, and we say this within the context of marriage 
But it is also true within the context of brotherhood and sisterhood and friendship, what God joins together, let no man put asunder. We hear that within the context of marriage, but I believe that's true. Whatever relationship is ordained by God, don't mess with things that are planted and established by God. Okay. Two ministers up here, so oh, he's I'm preaching, huh? Here. He's preaching, about to make me cry. <laughs> go ahead. I'm ready to talk about it. <laughs> so let's go. Let's move to question two. Um, okay. uh, either of you can answer this. How important do you think it is for young African American students to study law and become lawyers and or judges during times like this? I, I, I really, I really want to defer to Judge Penny because, and then I won't even respond. I want you to, I want you to respond because. 29 years ago when we met, Penny said to me, I, we, we were in just in the first week of class, and she said to me, I'm going to become a judge. She had, she did have some idea, but she had no idea that God would open the whole wide world. She was not just a judge within the state of Georgia, but God gave her an international syndicated TV show where she was a judge. And not only was she a judge, Penny, I'm just, I'm just saying your praise, my friend. Not only was she a judge, but she was a history maker. Penny had the honor of being the first African-American female to serve as counsel for the, for the governor of the state of Georgia. Wow. Well, let me just correct that. Okay. African-American in the nation's history. Come on. African-American, period. Period. To serve as a lawyer for a governor. That's right. That's Absolutely. Right. Yeah, that's, that's God. Um, God well, did that. Why is yeah. it important? It's important because now more than ever, social justice, which mm -hmm. we know is equalizing excess and the treatment of all of us is ever present. Okay. And many people now are not going into law the way they used to, mm -hmm. because we have this thing called the LSAT. And this exam is a, not an exam to get you into school. It's yeah. one of these systematic racist kind of exams that's meant to keep you out. And so we know that the schools, some schools are get, doing away with the SAT and the ACT. ACT. I'm so happy about that. Uh, yes. Anybody yes. who wants to go to school ought to go to school. Yes. And so I'm hoping that as time goes on. But if you want to go to law school, you can go. But I'm just wanting to say to you, don't let the fact that you convince yourself you can't test well. Because that's ridiculous. If you understand our heritage and where we came from, we created all of this. And for whatever reason, they're so masterful at holding on to white privilege. White supremacy has convinced us that a system that they created, where they created the language, they created the rules, they created everything about it, and yet they create it in such a way that they describe it so that somehow they make us believe we're not worthy of going there. But if you put us on an even playing field, if you allow us to go in, if you let me take that same test and rewrite it so that I can speak the language oh, and how we process, you watch and see what would happen. And so we need lawyers and judges and people who are truth tellers, not sellers, people who are wanting to tell the truth that I will not judge my worth based on your standards. Now, we have to play the game. And we have to do it, but that's why we have Howard University Law School. That's why we have Southern University Law School. We then have to go to our places where then we can then go forward. But I'm asking everybody who's considering it. I know that LSAT is what it is. But if you can do well in your schoolwork, what you can do is they'll look at your grades. And if you can have better grades than you can on testing, like, look, the test is a test of white supremacy now. Understand that. Because we don't process information like that from childhood because we don't even speak in that way. And so Penny, can, I, Penny, can I just jump? I, I want to jump absolutely. in and then, then pick back because, and, and, and I have a diverse audience who, who, who are listening. They're probably saying, well, what are they talking about? But what you and I know, my friend, is that these objective exams are really about relationship matching. And I don't match your relationship if you don't understand how to ask me a question that doesn't pertain to me. Right. So, so when she talks about the whole notion of white supremacy, I, it, it really comes from you speaking a language, you trying to get me to match your relationship, and you don't understand mine. Oh, absolutely. And I'm so happy you have a diverse audience because if you're under, trying to understand what this whole movement is about, 
Yeah, you yeah. have to understand that everything is written for a whole nother race and yeah. how they process everything. It's yeah. nothing against anybody. It's just right. that we're not sitting at the table writing the exam. Yeah. If we right. were, then we would say, no, we wouldn't quite phrase it that way. We would say it this way. Because if you said it this way, then we would know how to do it. Now, that's just one aspect of the test. I'm not talking about how public education, the government public education is funded. I'm not talking about our reading levels. You know, you have to understand that African Americans are not in any way uh, uh, marginal. We are marginalized so much that we don't have the same schools. We don't have the same tutors. We don't have the same things. So we're always at a point of having to catch up that's and right. Once we get there, we prove to ourselves yeah. because we've already been put in a box. And so when I speak of white supremacy and I speak of white privilege, I'm speaking of it from the perspective of wanting to educate the audience yeah. so that yes. you can understand when you see less than 5% of lawyers are African Americans and less than half a percent are judges. When you see us, when you see President Barack Obama, who was president, first African-American to be president of Harvard's Law Review, when you see that, you see black genius and exceptionalism as something you could never understand and grasp because we have had to rise above everything that was brought against us in order for us to be where we are. So I'm glad that this audience is diverse because this is an opportunity, particularly now, to explain it to them. It, it is. And, and Devin, every every Friday, Judge Penny has this wonderful, she has this wonderful platform, this wonderful show. It's sometimes she just calls it JP Live. Mm -hmm. it, it, even uh, all that, and last Friday, Penny, it was absolutely beautiful. When I saw those young minds, I was blown away. But I, I love that you gave them a platform. I love that you invited them to dialogue. And one of the things that I remember about that, one of the things that really came across was that one of our one of the things that we the beauty of what we can do is to let those who don't look like us get a chance to look through our eyes and and that that's a hard place for some people that's a strange place for some people but we can be the welcome mat to show you our perspective and it's nothing as you said it's nothing against you but this is an opportunity if we're going to change anything mm -hmm. we we have we have to dare to see through somebody else's eyes that's all we're saying that is so perfect because think about the protests. They're multiracial, multigenerational, because a lot of times in, um, and I'm trying to get the protesters on where I can have half white and half black, because in my classroom where I teach uh, criminal justice and the criminal justice, I teach a race and the criminal justice system. And what I do is I have a classroom of diversity. Everybody in the class is diverse. Good. and. What we've done is we're so afraid to speak about it. But when you speak the truth and empower, then we can move forward. What racism represents is a past. We have to reimagine what education looks like, what the law looks like, what America looks like from a perspective of inclusion of everyone. Because I know my white brothers and sisters, they don't want us not to be in a place where we're not treated equally. Right. But a lot of people didn't even know. That's what they said. They didn't even know that this was going on. They look at us, oh, we're so articulate, but they don't know the fight that it took to get where we are today. So I'm, I'm so happy that everybody's in on this platform so that they can really hear our perspective. Absolutely, absolutely. And we, we got to continue this, but, but go, go ahead. Yeah, so this is a very powerful conversation, and I, I'm not even watching the clock. I don't even know what time it is. I'm not doing my job <laughs> 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 because it's just good, and sometimes you just need to hear it. Like, you know, sometimes you, you have to hear um, what's relevant and what's true to help us to get through, you know, these, these times. And so if if people have to step away, they'll step away, but this is good, and that's why I didn't want to interrupt you guys. And we only have one more question. And, and, um, and, so not, only and, and, not, and not only must they hear it, but they must be willing yeah. to hear it. Because yeah. 
never willing to hear it. Every time the conversation starts, you're going to get up and walk away. Every time the conversation starts, you're going to shut down the computer. Every time the conversation starts, you're going to close the book. Every time the conversation starts, you're going to turn off the TV. You're going to flip the channel. You're going to say, I don't want to hear it. Or you're going to change the dialogue or you want to change the temperature in the room because you're not willing to hear it. I pray for is that God would give us all the willingness yeah. here because when we have the willingness to hear. God would give us the capability to hear. And the intellectual honesty requires that we tell the truth. Tell the truth. You know, yeah. we, we have no choice but to tell the truth. What is the point of getting all of this education? If people are wondering, what's the big deal? Why are they protesting? This yeah. is bigger than African-American males or females. This is bigger than the police. This it is. is about inadequate health care. This is about living in a country where we, everybody deserves to live out the principles of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. I took an oath. And when I put that robe on, it is the greatest thing that has ever happened in my life. But I know that we deserve, all of us, God's children. God is justice. Yes. We, we can't say we love God and, and, and we don't want to be a part of those who are marginalizing anybody. And, and that's why I love this young coalition that we have today. Yeah. Because they're seeing beyond what was old. If we're ever going to get to the place where we have to be, and I don't think we have to wait until the great by and by to get here. Not I think we should have the intellectual prowess to be able to sit and grapple with things that may be uncomfortable, but yet truth. Because the truth shall yeah. make you free. Isn't that what the sacred scriptures say? That's right. That's and we right. want to be made free. Yeah, yeah. Devin, we, we would go forever. Yeah. You have another question? Yeah, you had to come with the next good, question, or we would go forever. I, yeah, but it, this is good. And our other producer said the clock is fine. He's responding. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, good. We have to have these courageous conversations because we can't assume that our white sisters and brothers get it, get what we're going through because they don't live it. And so, and we can't be angry that they don't get it if we're not telling them. Yeah, we have to yeah. we have to let them know, and this is what we're doing. And so this is good. 